just think about it. Mr. Armstrong, Bart Several, ABC Digital. Wanted to give you the opportunity to swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Will you put your left hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked on the moon? Gentlemen. Mr. Cyber. Yes? <clears throat> if you really walked on the moon, why would you not do that? So why don't you just put the end to the record in the argument and put your hand on the Bible, swear to God you walked on the moon. Mr. Cyber, yeah. knowing you, that's probably a fake Bible. Really? Well, no, it's a real Bible. You have the opportunity to have $5,000. The meeting is not open. Well, you have $5,000 cash. You can give it to charity if you swear on the Bible that you walked on the moon. Please I have the cake. That'd be fine. Why don't you swear to... Why not? Why won't you do it? So why don't you put your hand on the Bible and swear to God that you walked yeah, on the moon? Mr. Seibel has made a fool of himself in front of the world. Mr. Seibel, you do not deserve answers. Neil Armstrong, welcome back. Thank you. Always great to be back. We've got some footage that I want to play to you uh, that John F. Kennedy was speaking about the mission and about the vision. This was early in the 60s. But why some say the moon? Why choose this as our goal? And they may well ask, why climb the highest mountain? Why 35 years ago fly the Atlantic? Why does Rice play Texas? We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Because that goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills. Because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win, and the others too. The extraordinary time in the US at that time, you had the president of that ilk, you had politics, um, the administration, science, the community, all on song for this vision, all on song for that plan. What, what was that like? Well, you have to appreciate the context. The Soviet Union had successfully uh, put uh, first a uh, artificial satellite into space and secondly put a man into orbit around the Earth. Uh, we were trailing. Um, we had put only one flight, Alan Shepard, on a short 20-minute suborbital flight up to about 100 miles of altitude and back down into the ocean. Never had a person in orbit. And now the president was challenging us to go to the moon. The gap between 20 minutes, a 20-minute up and down flight, and going to the moon was something that was almost beyond belief, technically. But NASA was a new organization, only about four years old at that point, had done a lot of thinking about this. And they identified the lunar landing as perhaps the only way we could catch up with the Soviet Union. And as the president said, uh, we, we were going we to get in this game. He was saying, this is, this is a new ocean around This is the new ocean, and we must sail upon it, and we must be a leader on it. And that caught people's imagination, because at that time, uh, we had the uh, ideological competition uh, between East and, and West, and uh, concerns about the future of, uh, of all humanity on, on Earth. So it was a very big thing, not just technically. It was uh, sociologically a very big thing, and the challenge was enormous. So to be able to get the, the agreement of, uh, of, the, of not only the, the government, but the will of the people to go along with that idea was quite striking. Pardon my, my crude summaries, but 
someone sketching out all the Apollo missions in advance, saying, well, if we're going to get there, it's going to take this many, many missions. And you knew you were involved in the missions. You didn't know fundamentally at that point who was going to ever be the person to walk on the moon, if ever. And how fluid was that, was that plan? It was, it was very, uh, very fluid. Mm. First, uh, the first Apollo spacecraft was on a, uh, a pre-flight test with the crew in the, in the module atop the rocket on the pad at Kennedy Space Center. But then what, it was Cape Canaveral. The cockpit was pressurized to at one atmosphere with pure oxygen, a little over and a spark ignited some of the flammable material in the cockpit. The, the hatch uh, was an inward opening hatch that the crew was unable to quickly open and the crew was, was killed in the fire. It was a tragedy. Mm. And it was going to take us a long time to recover from that. We clearly had an unsafe spacecraft. We had to redesign it and rebuild it, and it was a two-year delay. Now, there were only four years left to the end of the decade at that point, so this, this take, we're losing half of the time in the race, race to the moon. But there was a, there was a benefit. Uh, every, every advantage is accompanied by a disadvantage, and every disadvantage, there's a, every cloud is a silver lining. So we were looking for the silver lining. The silver lining we got was that we, were able, we had two years to re improve the spacecraft, not just the fire resistance, but a lot of other things in the system that really needed improving. So we could attack those and make a gigantic improvement in the quality of the spacecraft design and its construction. All the flights uh, changed somewhat during the evolution of those yes. flight periods. The, uh, the second flight, uh, after, the, after the first flight, to, was an 11-day flight to uh, make sure that the command module uh, had systems that would run for the length of a lunar mission, so they flew 11 days. And uh, that worked well, and the next flight was going to have a, a uh, c command module and also a lunar landing module on it. But the lunar landing module... Uh, was behind schedule, and it wasn't ready for a flight in 1968. So a very bold decision. They decided they would take the next flight on a third flight of the big Saturn rocket. The first two had been unmanned, and not, not perfect, but, but a few problems that they worked out. Not only take the third one and fly it with Yupins on it, but take it around the moon. An enormously bold decision, mm. but that moved our program along a lot further because now we knew we could navigate to prove that we could navigate to the moon, that we could communicate at lunar distance, and that they they could they that crew could take pictures of the potential landing sites and see what uh, what might, might be a good plan for future flights. It, it's extraordinary to hear all this and to know how short a period of time this knowledge growth was taking place. Oh, it was multiplying like, yeah. uh, like mushrooms, yeah. I was, I'm surprised you ever got to sleep. <laughs> so so what, 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 yeah, what happened then? I mean, so how long before you knew that the likelihood, or the team knew the likelihood that Eleven was going to do, was going to be the, the land and water? Well, uh, I, was, uh, I was the alternate or backup commander for the flight around the moon, Apollo 8. Right. And as soon as they took off, I was out of job, of course. And uh, the boss called me in a few days later and said, would you take the third flight down the, down the road, uh, 11? Mm -hmm. No. Eight was in the air. Nine was in the hangar yet. It hadn't, it hadn't started to fly. And 10 was uh, the lunar module had not flown. Uh, there was no way we could predict what each of those flights would do. It was going to depend on the success and the accomplishments of each, each flight along the build-up period. But Apollo 8 worked well, 9 worked well, 10 did far better than expected, took a lunar module actually around the moon and, and tried out its propulsion systems and its navigation systems and communicating with two spacecraft simultaneously. All these things were accomplished in just those four flights. And uh, so a month before the, uh, the launch of Apollo 11, my, my, uh, my cruise flight, uh, we decided we were going to, we 
we were confident enough that we could try an attempt uh, on, on a descent to the surface. And uh, I should say that uh, I thought uh, we had a 90% chance of getting back safely to Earth on that flight, but only a 50-50 chance of making a successful landing on the first first attempt. There's so many unknowns in that descending from lunar orbit down to the surface that had not been demonstrated yet by testing. And uh, there was a big chance that some, we didn't understand something in there properly and we had to abort and, and come back to Earth without landing. It's a risk-reward uh, equation. And uh, you're able to accept a level of risk so long as it's commensurate with the roar reward that you will get by achieving the goal that you're after Absolutely. and uh, that's kind of the that's kind of the balance you always make did you ever allow yourself the luxury and and for the time I've known you I suspect you're gonna say no but did you ever allow yourself the luxury somewhere between 8 and 11 of dreaming of the fact that you guys may be the team that actually does the deed um, no I can't say that I did I told you uh, we, so. we were we were we were focused on on progress and yes. making making those incremental steps, thousands of little incremental steps that got you closer. Yes. And uh, we're looking for success in those steps and not focusing on that own end goal too much. So, there's the phone call. Neil, it's 11, you're the commander. Your reaction at that point? Well, it, you know, I, I, was, uh, I, I was asked by uh, the bosses, uh, are, do you think you and your guys are ready? Are, are you, are, is there anything that you're really concerned about that you, you don't think we understand well enough that you, we can't go on? And so I was involved in those discussions. And, and, and I have to say, well, uh, you know, it'd be nice to have another month. But we were in a race here, and uh, there was some, some evidence that things were going on among our, our competitors, and we, we had to take the opportunity we had it. And I had to say, no, we're, we're ready. We are ready to go. Let's go to some footage, because this, this of course, is the launch uh, where all of this emotional journey you took the world on. Breakfast. Medical examination. Suiting up. Neil Armstrong, Commander Apollo 11. Edwin Buzz Aldrin, Lunar Module Pilot. Michael Collins, Command Module Pilot. to pressurize as far as the propellant tanks are concerned and an automatic sequence as the master computer supervises the third stage completely pressurized. Neil Armstrong reported back when he received the good wishes. Thank you very much. We know it will be a good flight. A from the Apollo 11 liftoff. All the second stage tanks now pressurized. What I saw in that footage was three, and perhaps I'm, I'm getting to an age where everyone looks young too, but I saw three young boys really who'd done so much work and who were taping up and getting ready for the adventure of their and the world's life. Can you, can you recall any of your thoughts at that time as you were preparing? Was it, was it all about the preparation? Did, the emotions well, playing a, up? It's a, it's a time of uh, meditation and a time when you're, when you're focused. Uh, on what you're really good, trying to do, but at the same time, there's a, a certain amount of uh, relaxed atmosphere. And the reason is, 
these rockets usually don't go off on time. <laughs> and uh, Neil, and, I was really excited up to this point. <laughs> so you, so you, so you're thinking, well, we'll get down to two minutes, and then they'll they'll call a hold, and then they'll cancel the flight, and we'll go another day. So don't get too excited here about about this one. So there was there was a sort of a, a, a built-in look. This we're, we're doing our best. It's likely not to happen. So. We'll look the part and see what happens. And you're always surprised when, when it actually lights and you, and you go. <laughs> so tell me, in relation to the noise of all that's going on, particularly from, from ground to the, next, yep. to the next hit, what sort of noise are we talking about? Oh, the, the noise at, at liftoff uh, from, from the pad is ex extremely loud. And uh, you get not only the noise of the engine, but the reflected noise that's coming up off the ground. And so consequently, for, until you fly out of that reflection after about 30 seconds, you, it's very difficult to hear anything, even with our special helmets and earphones and, and so on. But after you get out of, the ref, uh, out of the reflected sound, it gets pretty reasonable, a very shaky ride in, the, in that particular rocket, the Saturn V. Saturn V was a 3,000-ton uh, 3, 3, uh, machine. And, uh, it's, uh, that's uh, with an energy uh, enough to uh, more than that to lift you off the pad. It's uh, it's an environment that's uh, that's interesting. Very shaky ride in the early part of the launch uh, through the first stage. This the second and third stages are just as smooth as the first stage is uh, shaky. In terms of layman meets Snell Armstrong, which is this moment for me. What happens on a give me give me an idea of what happens on sleep patterns? Is there such a thing? Sleeping, sleeping. Yes, uh, we had a, a question in our own mind. We have this complicated uh, spacecraft to operate. Uh, are we going to have somebody awake all the time to run all the switches? What we would like to have done is sleep simultaneously and just put the craft on autopilot and uh, that would be most efficient uh, we mm -hmm. thought and uh, we the problem is that if, you, if we all want to sleep and then the spacecraft drifted off attitude somehow and lost antenna lock with earth they wouldn't be able to communicate to us that we had a problem if anyone came up so uh, we said, how, how can we solve that problem? We talked about uh, the, the concept with the, com with the computer guys and the simulator guys, and they thought maybe we could spin-stabilize the craft like a rifle bullet, and it would stay on, on path, and we'd have the antenna pointed right back down toward Earth. And the question was, well, would it last us eight hours while we were sleeping? Could, could it be done? They duplicated in the in the, in the simulator and determined that in fact you could spin stabilize it for eight hours, and you wouldn't have to spin it very fast, very very slowly would be enough to keep it on attitude, and we could keep contact for emergency contact with with Earth, and it worked. So that's what we did. We slept simultaneously, and then we could operate full efficiency for the other two thirds of the day. And in terms of the, the camaraderie that you build on, on a mission like that, not just that you're on a mission to the moon, but the, the nature of it, uh, you're all still alive and well, and that's fantastic. Mm -hmm. there, there must be something about lunar travel that's good for longevity, I'm thinking. <laughs> well, I hope that's true. Uh, we, we were a congenial bunch, uh, but uh, really focused on the job. You, uh, we really could not afford the luxury of diverting our attention away from our primary responsibilities because problems usually occur when you least expect them. Yes. And you can't get complacent. You have to keep paying attention. And we were very determined to keep paying attention. Yeah. So, Neil, it's, it's coming time to, to land. And as that process begins, you've got a computer malfunction telling you there's something wrong. What, what's the process you followed at that point? Yes, the, uh, the de lunar descent from lunar orbit down to the surface is, is uh, a very complex part of, of the overall flight. 
uh, with a lot of things happening simultaneously and and uh, not a lot of time to consider ab abnormalities when they arise. Uh, in the middle of uh, the descent, uh, we our computer did complain at us that was it was having a problem, but it didn't admit responsibility. Uh, uh, so. Sounds like uh, a modern computer. The, uh, I, I have to admit, I, I didn't understand the nature of this particular alarm. Uh, we had a lot, the computer had a lot of kind of complaints, but I didn't know them all. This one, this one was unusual. And uh, we asked uh, Mission Control on, on Earth to help us solve the problem, and uh, they didn't take very long to say, uh, you're cleared to continue. Uh, uh, that it was uh, it was an overload problem in the computer, but the central part of the computer that was doing our calculations of of our position and our navigation was working properly, and that was good news. So we continued on to the toward the landing site, but uh, then the computer showed us where it intended to land, and it uh, it was a very bad location. It was on the on the side of a uh, large crater about, uh, oh, I, I suppose, uh, 100, and, 100 or 150 meters uh, in diameter, and with very steep sl slopes covered with very large boulders, and not a good place to land at all. So I, I took over manually and flew it like a helicopter uh, out to the west uh, direction. We get, got into a smoother area with not so many rocks, found a found a, a level area and uh, was able to get it down there safely before we ran out of fuel. Yeah, within what, 20 seconds? Or Something like seconds. 20 seconds of fuel left. Uh, it's almost like you were planning to do a, prepare a movie here because everything was just on the edge of everything. Yeah. So the, the crafts landed. Is there a moment where the three of you at least momentarily acknowledge that moment? Is, is that... Indeed. We took a... It was a handshake. Uh, you really went to town, a, didn't you? Uh, 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 congratulations, we made it this far. Yeah. But uh, there was a lot of work to do at that point, and we couldn't uh, luxuriate in no. those feelings. And including getting home. Yeah, exactly. Well, at the moment, we didn't, uh, we concerned that, because the lunar surface is so warm, it's over, it's, it's over the boiling point of water, uh, and uh, substantially. And so the heat, the heat of the surface could affect fluids in the, in the uh, systems of the lunar module uh, adversely. We had to be very cognizant of potential thermal problems that might be in existence. And if it was going to get worse, we were going to have to take off immediately and, and get out of there. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, that worked out pretty well. There were these concerns, but uh, they, they seemed to be working out satisfactorily. So we agreed that we could stay up, stay on the surface uh, a bit longer. But we were going to keep, keep an eye on it for the first several hours. And, and your words, uh, people have professed as to why those words and whatever else. So were you, as you were coming closer into land, were they coming to mind? Oh, no, I didn't, I didn't think about that until after landing. I had no confidence in our ability to get down, down safely. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, it wasn't, I didn't bother thinking about, about that until after landing. And, and uh, of course, the, the first statement we made was, uh, the Eagle has landed. Yes. Tranquility Base here, the Eagle has landed. And that, that, was the, that was the signature line for achieving the presidential goal that we had uh, working, been working for a, a decade on. And, and in, in our view, that was, uh, that was a very important statement. And getting down on that was less important in our, in our view, but uh, uh, it, it was significant. Now, we actually touch a boot into the, into the sand and recognize that it's, uh, it's uh, okay to, to stand there. That's one small step for man, one giant leap for man. So you, you, you now then went and did the famous walk to plant the flag, but also to um, respect those that had been before and attempting to reach the moon and had been involved in the process. Tell us about that. Yeah, we, uh, we, we recognized that uh, uh, we wouldn't have been there if it hadn't been for our competitors. Yeah. Uh, in the Soviet Union. It was actually the competition that made both of our programs uh, able to do the things that they achieved. And so uh, 
we recognize that by putting some medallions for our fallen comrades on both sides who uh, had not lived to see the event and uh, and that w that was a tender moment. I was going to say there must be such an emotional moment because even in the time I've known you Neil as, as, as much as that was competitive there's such an element of decency in you as a person and to actually be on the moon and to say but by the grace of God I'm the one who did it mm -hmm. and and you know that that moment where you probably wanted a little privacy but other than the 400 plus million that were watching you had that moment it must be something that you have re reflected on over the years uh, it was uh, it was special and memorable but it was only instantaneous because yes. there was work to do yeah and the, you know the checklists were all over us. We needed to get on with things, and uh, and that's why we were there. We, we were there, there to meditate. We were there to to get things done, sure. and so we got on with it. Yeah. And so you 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 went back to the craft, and it's then that I think you heard that there was a phone call for you. Mm hmm. I I it, I am well, surprised. They didn't say phone call. They they said there's a something special here. Okay. Yeah. I forget what trying to modernise the story, but I'm, yeah. I'm wrong on that. So you, you've come back, and it's it's known to you that there's someone to speak to, yeah. um, and you didn't say, "Look, I'm busy at the moment." You did take the call. <laughs> I did. Take and the and call. who was that? And it was the president of the United States who was speaking from his office in the White House, and uh, a, a very a very nice congratulatory message uh, uh, from from the president on behalf of, uh, of everyone who had worked on the on the project and uh, and that that was a, a, a surprise a very pleasant surprise and uh, and uh, again yeah. there was work to be done so get back to job right. and so to to the to the lift off to return an issue with the ignition that required some rudimentary innovation yeah uh, um, we, uh, when, when you're in the in the spacesuit and, and it's pressurized, it's very cumbersome. You're the like the Frankenstein monster, and you have this big backpack back. And if you turn, that backpack is swinging around. And uh, and my colleague in one of these motions banged into the circuit breaker panel with his backpack and. Uh, and there's a lot of a uh, lot, lot of circuit breakers over there, lots of ones, and so he could have picked something that was not very important. But he banged into the circuit breaker that controlled the SN engine that got us back in, in into orbit. Uh, I think that uh, that when we recognized that, we thought uh, it, it probably will hold, but. Uh, Maybe we better see if there's a way to increase our chances of, uh, of, of making sure the circuit breaker wouldn't automatically disengage. Yes. So we took a piece of a, of a uh, plastic pen, uh, a magic marker kind of pen, and uh, made, a, made a little crutch to hold it in place. Like that. I think if they'd asked any of the 400 plus million that were watching that they're just about to insert part of a pen to ensure they get home, they wouldn't have believed it. <laughs> they wouldn't have believed it. Well, I'm, I'm, you know, I really think that had we not done that, we'd still been yes. all right. But uh, it was just insurance. It's nice to get a little insurance. Now. Yeah. On landing, of course, there was celebration that to a great extent I don't think's ever stopped. And ever since that time, there have been people who have claimed that that, that never happened. And imagine that, after all of, all of the effort and all the passion, that there are still people that would say that. What was your initial response to that when I, when I talked to you? You said something fascinating about the number of people that were involved in that project. Well, I, I don't recall what I said, but people love conspiracy theories. I mean, they are very attractive. Uh, but uh, it was never a concern to me because I know that uh, one day uh, somebody's going to go fly back up there and pick up that camera I left uh, <laughs> and uh, so then be sure that mm. well look I, I recall and I think it was a fantastic response uh, and that was because I'm, I'm, I'm hanging off every word you say nearly see I remember and and it was around about the fact that 
800,000 staff at NASA couldn't possibly keep a secret. <laughs> that's, that's and, right. and knowing how people work, I think that's so compelling, yep. I can't yep. tell you. But in that conversation as well, you, you alerted me to the fact that someone has put together the most marvellous combination of your landing against Google Moon mapping, yep. which side by side uh, clearly endorses not only that, but every crater, the flag, there's been no property development we've just uh, decided when we looked at the footage. <laughs> it's opportunity. Yeah. <laughs> Let's just have a quick look at it. This slide shows the trajectory to the surface. The actual power descent of the lunar module to the surface took 12 minutes and 32 seconds. And this is just the final three minutes, the part that's really interesting as you get close to the surface of the moon. Now, in the left screen, you will see the original 1969 movie film that we took from the window of the lunar module Eagle. And on the right side, you will see what the crew saw looking out the window in front of them. Now, there is a, a shaded area there that shows you the exact duplicate of the area that's on the left, so you can compare the craters and see if they are duplicate of each other. One on the left took place 42 years ago. This picture's on the right took place in the last two years. Okay, we've been descending. Uh, I should tell you, you'll hear the crewmen talking. My, they're my co-pilot giving altitude and, and descent rates, and you'll hear people in the background uh, talking from mission control on Earth. We've been descending uh, about 2,000 meters a minute. We're now down to uh, about below 1,000 meters in altitude. Uh, you s my my uh, com my computer tells me that we're it's taking us to a landing just on the right side of that big crater on the up in the up left hand corner. The slopes are steep and the rocks look very large, the size of automobiles. Certainly not a place that I want to land. So I took over manually from the computer, the autopilot, and flew it like a helicopter on out to the west to try to find a smoother, more level landing spot. The computer is complaining now and then. You'll hear oh, you caution alarms, 1202s and 1201s, which uh, is telling us the computer is a little bit concerned about its operation, but everything looks good, and the people in mission control tell us we can continue. Okay, we're about uh, 100 meters above the sort of looking down at this 30 meter crater, about 8 meters deep, looks like a real geological trader, uh, treasure. I want to go back there and look at that if I ever get the chance while I'm on, on my, my on foot. We're looking for a, a smooth spot beyond that crater. I see a smooth spot right up near the top of the screen. It looks like that's a, that's a good place to be, and I'm running low on fuel. I have less than two minutes of fuel. Getting down below about 70 meters now. 50 meters, still looking good. In the left side, you will see in the old movie that the rocket engine is starting to kick up some dust, dust off, the, off the surface. Get a 30-second fuel running. Need to get it down on the ground here pretty soon before we run out. Okay. The, the, the picture on the left is more accurate, but there's more dust. There you see the shadow of my landing leg coming on, on the surface, on the blowing dust. We're very close to the, the surface right now. Now that's amazing and to have you actually commentate through it uh, in a relaxed state, far more relaxed than you would have been 42 years ago is just very, very special. Recognizing the head start obtained by the Soviets with their large rocket engines, which gives them many months of lead time, 
and recognizing the likelihood that they will exploit this lead for some time to come in still more impressive successes, we nevertheless are required to make new efforts on our own. For while we cannot guarantee that we shall one day be first, we can guarantee that any failure to make this effort will make us last. I believe that this nation should commit itself to achieving the goal before this decade is out of landing a man on the moon and returning him safely to the Earth. We're approaching the 60-second mark on the Apollo 11 mission. T-minus 60 seconds and counting. We passed T-minus Astronauts report it feels good. T-minus 25 seconds. 20 seconds and counting. 10, 9, ignition sequence start. 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. 32 minutes past the hour. Liftoff on Apollo 11. We're now in the approach phase. Everything looking good. Altitude 4200. Houston, you're a go for landing. Over. Contact right. Tranquility base here. The Eagle has landed. That's one small step for man. One giant leap for man. But did the American Eagle really fly that far? Or perhaps it was pushed or chased by a Russian bear? Was the threat of the Russians making yet another space first enough to force the Americans into the most amazing hoax of all time? We shall send to the moon 240,000 miles away from the control station in Houston, a giant rocket more than 300 feet tall, the length of this football field, made of new metal alloys, some of which have not yet been invented, capable of standing heat and stresses several times more than have ever been experienced, fitted together with a precision better than the finest watch, carrying all the equipment needed for propulsion, guidance, control, communications, food, and survival on an untried mission to an unknown celestial body and then return it safely to Earth, re-entering the atmosphere at speeds of over 25,000 miles per hour, causing heat about half that on the temperature of the sun, almost as hot as it is here today, and do all this and do all this and do it right and do it first before this decade is out, then we must be bold. Think about it.